And so I'm sure you've heard anxious attachment, avoidant attachment. Now I am. We were just saying that like I haven't really cried through all of this, and I just you hear you talk about this stuff. Yeah, it was like the kids with my with mm-hmm. River is very emotional. Yeah, please because, proceed. <laughs> yes, because you love your children. Yeah. Leaders from Asheville and Buncombe County. From the newsroom to the nursery, we're juggling a demanding career on live TV with the demands of motherhood. I'm Katie. And I'm Karen. They are Anchor Moms. Welcome to another episode of Anchor Moms, the podcast. Here we have, um, this is a really special episode. We have a guest that we're going to tell you about here in just a second. Um, We know we have uh, a lot of new uh, listeners and watchers on YouTube. Anchor Moms is on YouTube. You didn't know that. Mm. Um, And um, so we just want to give you a quick reminder here. We, um, Karen and I, uh, work at uh, the ABC affiliate here in Asheville, North Carolina. And um, I- if you've been watching the news lately, you know that uh, Western North Carolina got uh, was hit uh, by the remnants of Hurricane Helene. And we are um, we are recovering. Western North Carolina continues to recover. It is very much um, a day to day thing here. Yeah, I think that. Um for folks who are not here, it's hard to understand just how far reaching this natural disaster has been for us. Um, I think as as it happens, and we know better than anyone because we work in news, uh, you know, a lot of folks have moved on from this crisis. And, uh, you know, there was Milton that hit Florida right after Helene hit. Um, but, you know, for the families here, life is still incredibly far from normal. Um, schools are still not in session. Many of them, um, I just got internet back at my house literally three weeks after we lost it. Um, people still don't have water. People still don't have power. Um, and the amount of devastation that we are still seeing and learning about the death toll continues to rise. Yeah, People are still missing. Mm -hmm. There's still people who are looking for their, uh, their friends and family. And that's an ongoing yeah, it's ongoing thing here um, a- across Western North Carolina. So, so it's a lot. It's, it's a, a lot. lot. Um, and so one of the reasons that we wanted to bring on a guest this week is because, as you can imagine, you know, this is a podcast where we talk about all things working mom. And right now, uh, whether you're a working mom or any mom or any person really in Asheville, um, you are trying to um, process all that's happened, deal with this incredible loss that our community has suffered. Um, and for folks with kids, of course, having those difficult conversations with their children. Um, I know my children have been struggling. I know River has had some tough times too. Of course, River is a whole nother level because you all lost your house and um, had have uh, that going on as well. So um there's just a lot that we're trying to work through with our children. And so we wanted to bring on a a therapist who could kind of help us figure out how to proceed during all this. You know, the other thing that's becoming abundantly clear is that, um, I mean, this is not just weeks or months. This is going to be a very long process. Asheville will never look the same. Many communities in Western North Carolina will never look the same. And, um, it, how do we deal with all this? How do we talk to our children about right. all this as we are stressed, overwhelmed, emotional, trying to deal with all of this ourselves as adults? So we invited in uh, Susie Lynch. Uh, she's a counselor at Asheville Family Counseling. And honestly, she has um, such helpful things to say. So listen in. Okay, so Susie Lynch joining us now. Thanks so much for coming in, Susie. Uh, Katie and I both have a lot of questions just about how to talk to our kids about this natural disaster. Um, And I think a lot of other parents are kind of in a similar boat. Um, One thing I think just in general, you know, my kids range from two years old to nine years old. Mm. And I guess I'm a little bit struggling with, is there Um, should I be shielding some things from the younger kids and maybe explaining more to the older kids? Are there certain age um, ranges where we should be sharing more about um, the really difficult things to talk about, the deaths that have happened in this storm? Mm -hmm. Um, What is your guidance on that? 
Yeah, I think when I think about children in general, they catch on, right? They know what's happening. They know something's going on. And so providing them with some information is really important um, because otherwise they're going to feel even more scared, like something's happening and I don't know what's happening. Um, I think, you know, it it is dependent on the child. If they, if they recognize, oh, people have died or they ask you that, like you want to encourage them to ask as many questions as they want. Um, and then be careful about not going into the gory details, right? Like, yeah, natural disasters happen. They're out of our control. Um, but, you know, there are things we can do to prepare or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so making sure that they feel informed because a lot of time, times information feels safe, right? When we know more information, there's a level of safety um, and feeling like, okay, if I know what's happening, I can maybe make a plan or I can talk to my mom about it. Um, and so limiting like the gory details, right? You don't want them seeing pictures of dead people sure. online. Oh. Um, and then, yeah, for like older kids, I think, you know, they may want to start researching natural disasters or start to understand weather or show some interest in those things. And I think that that's a really healthy way to go about coping with it. Just making sure that, again, it's limited, that their whole time isn't involved in looking things up, understanding weather, because that can add to the panic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think, if I keep checking, if I keep checking the weather, I'll be able to do something about it. It gives us a false sense of control. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about balance. And I think, yeah, for a two-year-old, it's really going to be more about, like, they're going to show up with big feelings that could look like um, behaviors they haven't engaged in in a while. Um, and so for them, it's really about um, like secure attachment. <laughs> so um, I don't know if y'all know, do you know a lot about attachment theory? No, but theory? I'm really interested. Yeah. Yeah. So attachment theory is basically like the basis of my approach to therapy. And so attachment theory, there have been studies, but the basic idea is that um, the relationships we form with our primary caregivers um, really tell us about the safety of the world, right? And so I'm sure you've heard anxious attachment, avoidant attachment. Now I am. We were just saying that, like, I haven't really cried through all of this. And I just, you like, hear you talk about this stuff. Yeah. With, like, the kids with my, with mm -hmm. River is very mm -hmm. emotional. Yeah. Please because, proceed. <laughs> yes, because you love your children. Yeah. And I think the most important, like, even in my therapeutic space, right, the most important thing is that people feel seen, heard, and validated, right? And so secure attachment can heal so many other things. It can make us feel safe. It can make us feel confident. It can make us feel like, you know, we we have backup. We have people around us. Um, and the thing that I think people was really important to know about attachment theory is this concept called attunement. And so say I'm a kid and I'm crying. Um, and what I need is for my mom to like, just sit with me in the darkness, sit with me through it, be my partner, like just be there. And I think it's human nature to want to fix, to change. Um, and so really just being there in the feelings, not trying to downplay it, make it go away, but rather be like, yeah, like mom is scared too. Yeah. That was really scary. And I'm like, you know, your parents will always be here to help keep you safe in that. Um, and so allowing them, just like you're allowing yourselves right now and demonstrating to them, right? Crying is okay. This was hard. And we have the skills and tools we need. Kind of that balance between this is scary and also um, there are things within our control that we can do. Um, so really just intentionally it's instinct, right. To be like, oh, let's do something fun to distract you or, um, say it's not that bad or even make promises you can't keep, right. Like this isn't going to happen again, or, you know, something that is just not within your control, but rather we can prepare for this. We can find a way to make sure we're okay within all of this chaos. So we, um, just to catch you up, we had a tree fall on the back of our house mm -hmm. and our houses. I mean, much like lots of families here in Western North Carolina where we can't live in our house right now. We're living in temporary housing. And then to make matters worse, my daughter um, fell off a swing and broke her arm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the day after all of this happened, right? So she just has been through a lot. And it's been 
it's been really stressful for my husband Mm -hmm. and I, as like you can imagine, as we're navigating like insurance and finances and where to live and how we could move back into our house Mm -hmm. before we make repairs, how to have surgery not in Asheville because, you know, when she broke her arm, you know, just all of those things. And I... I sometimes, you know, we find ourselves having these conversations in front of River and they they get like sort of heated. And I'm I guess I'm wondering, is it okay to tell River that like dad and I are really stressed too? Mm-hmm. Like this is a really hard time for us because I I don't want her I think it's scary for her, but like I also want her to understand that like we're feeling the same way, but I don't want to scare her mm-hmm. more. Yeah, I think Letting a kid on uh, in on the fact that mm-hmm. you're stressed is really important because it's modeling for them kind of the honesty that it takes to get through something like this. Um, and then if you do get heated, like the one thing, well, one of the things I always tell parents is like, you're not going to do it perfectly, but you do get to like have a conversation afterwards, right? We're all stressed to our limits. We're in survival mode that makes us more irritable and and like emotional, Mm -hmm. right? And so talking about it, not just letting it happen and then being like ignoring it, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But you want to be like, hey, like mom really just lost it right there. I'm really stressed too, but I want to let you know that like I'm sorry for like, you know, talking to you that way right. or scaring you. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Raising my voice. Yeah. Because it's really about that attachment. When we know that adults can make mistakes too, that gives us the ability to make mistakes and also repair. You'll have your kids being like, you know, sorry, mom, I was really mad and I yelled at you. Yeah. Um, so I think it is really important to let them know that you're feeling it too, because when we grow up in homes where everyone pretends everything is fine, but we feel in our body that something isn't right, that leads us to gaslight ourselves in the future, right? I don't trust my body to tell me when an emotion is happening. And so I think it's really important to share that you're stressed while also not, there's this line that I'm sure you have experienced with people is like, um, maybe your own parents, (laughs) but like not um, having them be your therapist which I'm sure y'all don't, but sometimes it's easy when, especially when our kids are older, right, to Mm -hmm. want to lean on them. Um, So the balance between letting them know you're stressed and sad and overwhelmed while also being like, and we're going to figure it out, Mm -hmm. but this is just a period of time that is really hard. You you know, the other thing is, is River does not want to go. So we're staying in temporary housing and she does not want to go back. Of course, we go back to our our you know our Mm -hmm. Asheville house all the time just because we're trying to do repairs meeting contractors and she is we've had to find she has to stay with somebody when we do these visits Mm because she doesn't want to go back at some point where she's gonna have to go back how do we talk to her about that what do we say yeah I think giving her as much time as you can right Mm -hmm. to figure it out and then really getting curious Right. And I don't. How old is she again? She's six. Six. Yeah. Yeah. Six year olds. I mean, (laughs) children are smarter than we give them Mm -hmm. credit for, you know. Mm -hmm. And so getting curious about like, okay, what what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. What is scary to you? And like, what can we do to help comfort you in that? Is it bring your favorite stuffy? Is it, you know, uh, I don't know, listen to your favorite music while you go. Just something to make sure that you are like planning as much as you can for the things they're most afraid of. Um, And so curiosity and asking questions so that she feels like, okay, I I am in a place where maybe this is okay to do. My, one of our kids is a similar age. She's almost six. um, And she keeps saying, please stop talking about the storm. The adults just Mm -hmm. keep talking about the storm. Mm -hmm. Please stop. Um, It's scary to me. And you know, unfortunately, we have to. Yeah. We have to figure out what we're going to do about school, you know, all these things. And I don't, and I don't know if those just need to all happen after she goes to bed. Mm. I don't know if that's bad to, like you said, you don't want to just say, oh, la di da, life is normal. Let's mm-hmm. talk about Halloween. And, you know, but yeah. I don't know where that balance is. Yeah. And, and I think, again, this is an opportunity to get curious because, That could just be her setting a boundary, right? Like, I have heard enough for right now. I don't want to hear more. 
Or it could be avoidance, right? Like, I don't want to think about this thing that is scary. Um, and so really asking her, like, what is, like, what's so, what is upsetting? Like, what are you feeling in your body? What are the thoughts that are coming up? Um, so you can really understand if this is like healthy boundary or avoidance. Um, and at the same time, all kids are going to respond differently and some are not going to want to talk about it. Um, and so always reminding them that they can, that you're here to answer questions, that you're here to hear what they're feeling and like they can take their time if they need to. Um, because for different kids, it's going to show up quickly or later, you know, you never know when that response is going to come. And so I think saying to her, you know, part of what you said to me, which is we really have to talk about it. Like there are some things in life that are really hard and scary, but we do have to talk about them. What can we do to help you regulate during this or what, you know, what do you need from us? And so Real, yeah, curiosity with kids. They they have intuition. They're going to tell you stuff and you're going to be like, oh, like that's really yeah. wise or like you know yourself really well. My Our two-year-old literally every single time we walk outside still says, is it thundering? Is it safe? Is is it going to yeah. rain? And obviously he's little. Um, but even those questions, you know, and you mentioned it earlier, I'm so tempted to say the storm is over. It's not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. That is such a big storm that, you know, it won't happen again. Everything's fine. But to your point, maybe that's promising something that I don't know. Yeah. I can keep up with. Yeah. And so he, he goes outside and he says, is it raining? Is it thundering? Yeah. He's just at like, is it safe? Did I just hear thunder? Mm -hmm. Is it going to rain? You know, he's, he's very aware when we're outside that, oh gosh, is, is this going to happen again? Yeah. So something that you can say that is true is that like right now the weather's okay, right? It's not raining. It's not thundering. We're okay right now. Um, and then maybe finding some sort of like I don't know, um, like little preparedness kit he could have, <laughs> like a little kid version, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, well, we have your raincoat and your boots or and your favorite mm -hmm. book in the car. So if, in case something does happen, you're prepared. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be um, as surprised this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that somebody has said to me early on in all of this is that I th you know, you have to take care of yourself. You have to put on your oxygen mask before mm -hmm. you put on others' oxygen yeah. mask. Can you just – some advice for parents? I know Karen and I are not alone here in Western mm -hmm. North Carolina parent-wise. What what's just some self-care or good advice for parents out there trying to navigate, you know, their kids' emotions but also their emotions mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. I mean, you can't fill someone else's cup if yours isn't mm -hmm. full. and so. I know there are so many things that feel urgent, right? Fixing your house, getting in touch with insurance, contacting FEMA, figuring out what's going on with school, and like to take breaks, whether that's with your kids or on your own, and do very simple things that bring you joy. Like sit outside and look at the sky for a minute. Um, read a few pages of your favorite book. One thing I love to do is watch comedy specials on TV, right? You, it is so important to bring in moments of joy and peace right now. And I know it can feel so weird, right? When it feels like the world is in a mess. Yeah. How am I, is, am I allowed to feel joy mm -hmm. now? Am I allowed to take care of myself? And I would say that that is in fact the most important thing to do um, is to do those things, whether it takes two minutes or an hour, whatever amount of time you have to do something that is caring for yourself. And your kids will see you doing that. And that's modeling, right? How to regulate our emotions, how to take care of ourselves. So it's like a double whammy of goodness, you mm -hmm. know? Is there any good news here? I mean, obviously, this there's, you know, it's hard to see a silver lining. Um, is there, you know, so River started a temporary school this week. And mm -hmm. I've been really impressed at how resilient mm -hmm. she's been. Yesterday, she came home. She has her cast signed by, you know, her old classmates or normal classmates, yeah. but like the kids in the other first grade and that first grade that she was joined by. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I don't know. Maybe kids are better at this than adults. Like is, 
can we say that this is going to, in the future, maybe build some resiliency in our kids? They're going to mm-hmm. look back at this and be like, I can do hard things because I did I did all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when I was thinking about it before coming on, I was thinking about how this is such a beautiful opportunity to help kids know that they have the ability to get through hard things, right? To learn how to express their emotions, ask questions, express their fears, um, learn to self-regulate. Um, you know, resilience is a real complicated thing. Resilience yeah. is wonderful. And, you know, we don't want to have to be resilient all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think in all of this community, right, she's learning that other people that she doesn't even know are there and support her by writing their name on the cast. I think there are beautiful lessons to be learned. Um, and there's something – polyvagal theory is just about like our nervous system regulation, but something called glimmers, which are basically the opposite of a trigger. So thinking of noticing the bird on the tree, right? Noticing these like really beautiful things in life that still exist in the chaos can really help us to train our brain to pay more attention to those. Um, And so it's a, it's an opportunity to help them develop these coping skills that are going to, I mean, be so important for the rest of their lives. Um, one of the things that I think Katie and I both have dealt with is, which you get it, our kids are acting out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, especially in my house, I mean, we have four kids and it's very crazy. <laughs> and um, I think my husband and I are both like, oh, my goodness, like, Everyone is behaving so terribly and, you know, you want to say, look, we've been through this big thing, like, we get it. But you also don't want to just let them kill each other, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't know any guidance on how to manage those tantrums and big emotions mm-hmm. while also making sure that there are some boundaries in the house. Yeah, yeah. And first, I'm just going to say you're not going to do it perfectly and that's okay. Because you're going to lose your temper. They're going to lose their temper. Like, we are in a high-stress situation and kids being at home all day, maybe (sighs) starting to go back to do activities, um, it's just going to be hard. Um, I think, you know, one thing that comes to mind and I talk to parents about a lot is um, there's the behavior, but then there's, like, the emotion or the need or, like, the skill that's missing underneath, right? So a lot of times when kids get really angry or like fight, there's a need that they have that isn't getting met. And so maybe not in those exact moments, right? But afterwards, when everyone's more regulated, kind of talk to them about what happened for them in that moment, right? What happened right before? What did it feel like in your body? Um, And is there something you need? Um, Because I think the behavior is like, what alerts us to a need or to a skill that's missing, right? I felt really activated and I didn't know how to let it out. So I yelled at my brother. Well, let's try some like calming skills or coping techniques. Um, And they're going to (laughs) fight, you know, like I wish I could prevent it. But I think that giving yourself grace, giving yourself the, like allowing yourself not to perfectly do it, but rather Again, come back around and talk about it with them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I I can understand like if parents are getting overstimulated, which I know I would, allowing yourself to also take a pause, take space, um, because sometimes when there's this activation happening, almost what needs to be done is everyone needs to kind of go to their own space mm-hmm. to regulate. Um, yeah, and it's it's hard. I can't imagine having four kids <laughs> in my house. Who are stir (laughs) crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, for sure, any parent right now is just craving that schedule and the routine that I think all children are wanting to just get back to normal, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Um, Another question I had is, you know, on our drive that we make um, is through an area that was really badly hit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they see that. And and part of me is, should I be going a different way? Should I like... You know, seeing this, I mean, both of our neighborhoods still just have, of course, as everywhere in Asheville, trees down everywhere. There's massive piles of debris and, you know, our 
girls' gymnastics studio has the mats outside covered in mud and, Mm -hmm. you know, those types of things that they're seeing, these places that they thought were safe and Mm -hmm. destroyed. Um, You know, I've even thought maybe does it make sense for us to, like, take a couple days and, like, go away so they get a Mm -hmm. break from seeing that to a place that wasn't affected? Um, I don't know. Is that – does that make sense or – It it does make sense. And I think there is always this balance between – protecting kids from things um which like is good in some instances right like i said you don't want to give them all the details or like all the nitty gritty sure. um but also if we protect kids from everything they're not going to know how to cope and regulate and like take care of themselves and get through hard things and so i think changing the way you drive if one of your kids asks you to Maybe get curious with them. Um, And it's so kid dependent. Um, But I think getting away, taking a weekend somewhere, giving them some normalcy or some sense of like, okay, we're not stressed all the time is a great idea if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, If you can't, you know, do things like have a pajama party in a fort in your living room, you know, just things to um, connect as a family spend intentional time together because human connection and like security in that these people have your back and they care about you is really a big part of what helps us get through hard things, especially when we have no control. (sighs) Is there anything you wanted to add that we haven't asked you about? Mm, I think one thing that comes up for me is just making a plan with your kids if you didn't have one, right? And it doesn't have to be this elaborate, like, you know, um, 1,200-step plan, but rather, like, okay, like, if if this happens again, you have your little go bag or, like, your bag with, like, things that you need in case we do have to leave. Um, having some amount of um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, – Agency, agency mm-hmm. over what what happens next could be really helpful. And the other thing is just like you are doing the very best that you can. And our best looks different at different times. Like you are in survival mode and maybe some of your own past trauma, some of your own stuff is coming up. And so like our best right now is going to look a lot different than it did before the storm. Um, and so really just having grace and compassion for yourselves. This is this is so hard. We're experiencing a collective grief and thinking about, like you said, the gym mats outside of the gym, uh, the gymnastics place. Right. Um, they're grieving not being able to go to gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Like there are so many things to grieve that we often don't talk about. Yes, we grieve loved, loved ones who pass. But we also grieve the loss of a safe space. We grieve the loss of a routine. We grieve the not being able to see our best friend every day, something like that. And so, um, yeah, just acknowledging grief. It is a thing we avoid in our society because it it's hard. But grief teaches us so much. Um, and so really talk about grief and maybe come up with rituals or something that can really help kids embrace like grief is a part of life it's hard it's going to hit me when I don't don't even expect it and it's important and I can get through it I feel like we might need you on speed dial from <laughs> okay. here on out yes, I- um, <laughs> so much good advice and here Katie and I have just been crying through this whole thing but you've been so wonderful to answer all of our questions and I think that this is what so many parents here yeah. are struggling with, right? We want to make sure our children are okay. Mm-hmm. And it's just hard to see, see the way out, I guess. Yeah. Um, and okay can mean different things, right? I know my parents always say, like, well, are you happy? And sometimes that's true, right? But I can be okay and be having a really hard time, right? And so okay doesn't mean all behaviors are on point and they're, you know, they're showing up in ways that they could outside of the tragedy, but more like they feel safe and secure with the people around them or in their ability to handle a big emotion. Yeah. 
Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, I'm great. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. It's been really wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the advice. I know lots of moms are, are yeah, listening and want to yeah. share this yeah. with their yeah. thank you. families as well. And just know there are so many amazing therapists in Asheville. Like we are here. We are ready to help you. And like getting yourself help is, you know, encouraged if you need it. Because sometimes it's bigger than we know what to do with. Thank you so much, Susie. You're welcome. Okay. Oh Thank gosh. you. Sorry, we were this like, was like a free, is this a free therapy session? Mm-hmm. I know, right? Sure. Like, you know? And a big thank you to Susie for coming in and um as you heard, Katie and I it was very emotional for us. Um lots of tears. I think what we're dealing with is not um abnormal for most parents here in the area and even if You know, maybe you've lived through a different type of crisis in your life or um, another terrible natural disaster. Um, You know, you might be familiar with some of these feelings and some of these difficulties that so many of us are trying to navigate. Um, So we appreciate Susie's uh, advice. Insight. Yeah, there was a lot of things I learned and some really good tips that um, I think we can, um, you know, start using right Mm -hmm. away. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, this is not going to go away tomorrow. So I think our children, you know, we'll see what the future holds and how um, we help them deal with this moving forward. But um, hope everyone out there is staying um, optimistic, is staying strong, staying sane. Yes. All of the things. Um, If you're not in this area, um, just you know this is this is what we're dealing with right now and unfortunately it feels very odd to talk about anything else because this is literally consuming Katie and I's lives every day um we also want to mention that again we will post some suggestions for places to donate if you'd like to help out um the need is still very very great um one thing i want to mention just because i keep hearing it over and over again is that people are not needing or groups organizations are not needing supplies as much as money, monetary donations, because, and I've seen this firsthand here in our community, you know, a lot of places get a ton of bottled water or a ton of one specific item, and then it kind of stockpiles, and that's not necessarily what the need is, you know, forever. Um, So rather than trying to guess what people might need, I think monetary donations are best. And uh, listen, I can speak to this just because, um, you know, our our house, uh, we were displaced from our house. And yeah, and people are starting to get water and power back on, mm-hmm. but they are trying to um, pay for additional childcare because mm-hmm. their kids are out of school. They are trying to repair their homes. Their um, Asheville is a tourism town, so so many people are out of work mm-hmm. during all of this. Restaurants so, cannot yet reopen. Mm-hmm. Many of them. Money, monetary donations, I think, is what Western North Carolina needs right now. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for walking with us through all of this. And we'll be back next week. Anchor Moms is a Sinclair podcast produced out of WLOS in Asheville. We're your hosts, Katie Killen and Karen Zakalak. Anchor Moms is edited by Matthew Yates. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode and to stay up to date on future episodes, follow us on Instagram at Anchor Moms. You can follow Anchor Moms on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Know a parent who could benefit from this week's Anchor Moms episode? Your recommendations help our show to grow, so spread the word.